I just want to say uh, right, right off the bat, I just so appreciate worship in this place. So all of you people that, uh, that serve on the worship team, um, it, is, it makes coming to church meaningful for me. I'm so grateful, so grateful. One of the things I am consistently challenged with um, and have reflected on just recently is what kingdom am I building? Am I building my kingdom or am I building thy kingdom? And that question is used in Old Testament language. It's framed in Old Testament language with the prophet Haggai. And he uses uh, a charge to the people of Israel to build the house of the Lord. And that's what I want to look at today. I want to look at the minor prophet Haggai. I want to look at the entire book of Haggai. And it is 60 chapters long. So hold, no, I'm just kidding. It's two. Um, It is two chapters. And we're going to look at just a couple of pieces to get an overview of this with the hopes that, A, I want to give what I think is the part of the message that is meaningful to us, especially as we finish up one year and look ahead to the next. But as another way of framing and looking at the Old Testament, and especially one portion of it. So in order to do that, I want to set the context of this book and then dive into some of the portions of it. So I am a history teacher, so I'm making no apologies for at least the first couple of minutes. This is the prophet of Haggai, um, and I've been preparing this message for a number of weeks, and I just learned literally about three or four days ago that the festival of Haggai is celebrating the Eastern Orthodox Church today. How cool is that? So, uh, so December 29th is, and so we're going to take a look at the prophet Haggai. But in order to do that, I want to set the historical context. So Haggai takes place in 520 BC. I know that means a lot to everybody in this room. Um, so let me frame it just a little bit wider um, by, by setting an important historical context. The, the temple and Jerusalem had been completely destroyed in 586. And this will actually connect to Pastor's recent message, right, where he looked at the Babylonian Empire and Daniel. That, remember that Daniel was one of the Jews who was taken and removed from Jerusalem to Babylon. And that was that series that we looked at in Daniel. Well, the Babylonian Empire was taken over by the Persian Empire, and actually Daniel even served a little bit under that. But there are your four leaders of the Persian Empire, and the first one, uh, Cyrus, actually issues a decree which is significant because he allows the Jews to return. And this is a big moment because when the temple is destroyed in 586, this would have been, in Jerusalem, this would have been a disorienting and traumatic event for the people of Israel. This was their homeland and in many ways where their identity was set and established. And now everything was thrown into chaos. But there was a promise and a hope with this return that Cyrus issues. And so they return. The problem, though, is the work on building the temple stalls. For 18 years, after, the, 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 after Cyrus issues this decree to go ahead and return, and Israel goes back, they start building, and then the work stalls for 18 years until the prophet Haggai and if you want to take a look, Zechariah, who's right next door in the Bible, those two issue prophetic words to move the people of Israel. And I think that that word is applicable to us. How are we building our spiritual lives? And so Haggai issues this word, and it is significant, and it actually is effective. And in the beginning right here is that the temple does get built within five years, and the walls actually get rebuilt, but that's under a later time frame. And just to set the biblical context for all of us, if you want to understand, if you want to track some of this initial return, that's in the first part of Ezra. And the later part of Ezra, as well as Nehemiah, deal with the walls being finished. And just as a side note, Esther, the story of Esther, takes place in the Persian Empire. But that's actually taking place back in Persia, while all of this action that we're looking at is in the attempt to rebuild Jerusalem. With that context, I want to zero in on Haggai and look at his 
prophetic word. And actually, in the book, you can actually divide it into three portions of Scripture where there's three separate prophetic words, and they all take place in a very short amount of time. You can see that they only take place in a couple of months' time. And so what I want to do is I want to spend the majority of our time looking at the first prophetic word, and then we'll take quick snapshots at the second and the third prophetic words as a way of looking at our spiritual lives, at looking at the kingdom that we are choosing to build. And let me put one quick qualifier around this, that a lot of times churches will use the book of Haggai in the midst of a building project, and I would never, ever didn't know. Um, <laughs> And I am keenly aware, how can I not, you know, looking right out that window, that there is this. But I actually want to be very deliberate and talk about what are we building internally, individually. I actually su suspect and am quite confident there is a communal nature to this message, too, about how we're moving together as a church. But for our purpose, I want to look at how does this apply to each of us. And what are we building? And how are we building? And how are we choosing to prioritize and invest the things that we've been asked to steward? So here's where the book begins. It says, this is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say the time has not come to rebuild the Lord's house. Remember, 18 years of stall. The word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in a paneled houses while this house remains in ruin. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build my house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord, because of my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with your own house. A pretty strong word. He makes this dichotomy between what we're choosing to build. Are we building our own house or are we building the house of the Lord? And the immediate application that I want us to focus on is how are we building the spiritual house that we've been entrusted to personally and individually? And that work had stalled because some people had taken a selfish path and chose to build paneled houses and focus their time on their house. So let's look at the, what this building actually looks like. So one of the first things I want to suggest is that building the house of the Lord is about prioritizing what the Lord has called us to. And I think this is the first point that I want us to consider, that for many of us, we have actually had words that have been spoken over us, or we've had dreams, and sometimes those have fallen by the wayside. And what do we choose to prioritize? The second portion is what are we choosing to invest in? And when I say invest, I'm meaning how are we investing our time, our talent, and our treasure? Is our investment into the things of God or are they choosing, are we choosing to build our own kingdom? And Haggai's word comes a little bit sharp and comes into our face. One of the things that I actually appreciate in thinking about a prophet is that my traditional view of a prophet is somebody that comes down with this burn or turn kind of message that is very shocking and kind of seems a little bit uncomfortable. And I think that it is. But one of the, one of the things that I've reflected on about prophecy is that God cares enough about our situation that he does come and he confronts us. The loving thing is to draw this to our attention and to suggest a course of action and change. Where in many cases, the easier path would be one to ignore. And the grace that I see in the midst of a prophet like Haggai is that God makes the move to his people. He is not content to leave us where we are at. But the question is why? Why had the work stalled? 
And for that, I want to look at another quick passage that provides a little bit of context about why this work had stalled for 18 years. Then the people around them, this is in Ezra, the people around them set out to discourage the people of Judah and make them afraid to go on building. They hired counselors to work against them and frustrate their plans during the entire reign of Cyrus and down to the reign of Darius, the king of Persia. So they faced opposition. And I think there's at least three significant reasons why the work had paused and that were obstacles in the face of these Hebrews that were trying to rebuild the temple. The first obstacle that I think many of them faced was the disappointment. I think many people had returned with the expectation that things were going to be great. They had dreams. They had expectations of the way that things were going to be. And when they got there, it was hard. And their life screamed that this was not the way that it was meant to be. And I think for many of us, we can actually find ourselves in the midst of that place where we have dreams, we had hopes, we had expectations. And for whatever reason, maybe this past year, maybe it's longer, those dreams seemed to have died. And it's easy to give up. The text also suggested two other reasons that the counselors were working to discourage them. And I think many of the people of Israel felt this profound sense of discouragement, especially in the face of opposition. And the other word that is suggested in Ezra is fear. And when we put disappointment, discouragement, and fear all together, it can lead to stalling. And we find ourselves in a place that we did not expect to be. And I often think that it doesn't just happen immediately. It is a series of small decisions to take a step back or to simply remain where I am. And two years ago, I had this, this feeling as I was reflecting on the new year, I was, I was reflecting in front of the Lord, and I had this sense from him that he gave a quick snapshot and kind of allowed my static nature of where I was. It wasn't anything bad per se, but he showed what that static nature was going to look like if I carried it forward two to three years, and I didn't like what I saw. sometimes we can find ourselves in a place where we are stalled and we've drifted from where we ever intended to be. And it's in the midst of that that God gently comes and reminds us and speaks a word to us and asks the question, what are we building? And how are we building? And what are we choosing to invest our time in. So last month, I had some work that I had to do uh, down in the New York City area, um, and it was Jonathan Sigmund's birthday, and so the, the timing lined up perfectly, and so I invited Jonathan to, uh, to come down with me, and so we went down. We actually went to a basketball game together, a New Jersey Nets game, and um, we were having a great time. Um, it, the, the game was about halftime, and we, uh, I kind of looked down at my phone, and I realized um, that, that the game was going on and I hadn't looked at my phone in a while. And then I received this text message from my wife. And she said, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but our basement has some water damage. The worst part is by the stairs. So we have this home project that's all of a sudden right there. The problem is that I missed this prophetic message right here. And she sent that literally about two seconds or as I was typing and responding with this text message that followed immediately on the heels of this warning and prophetic message. (laughs) 
This is called a problem. <laughs> I missed the message. And if I didn't realize it then, I got this message as a quick follow-up. You didn't see those two text messages right before you sent me the picture of you and Jonathan, right? And the answer is, uh, <laughs> no, I didn't. I missed the message. The good news for Israel is that they did not miss the message. They heard this message of conviction. And here's how the scripture accounts for their response. Then Zerubbabel, Joshua, and the whole remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the message of the prophet and Haggai because the Lord their God had sent him and the people feared the Lord. What is cool about that particular response is that the prophet, the king, the priest, and the people were all functioning together. They were moving in the same direction. And this was exactly the problem that had led to the collapse of the temple in Jerusalem earlier. But now they heard the message and they obeyed. And once that obedience happens, the second piece comes into focus. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave this message of the Lord to the people. I am with you. And this is God's promise. In the midst of discouragement and disappointment and fear, that when we make the move to set the intention of our heart to follow God, he responds with the promise that I am with you. And this is a recurrent theme throughout scripture that he offers to people when they find themselves in desperate situations. To name just one of my favorites, when Joseph finds himself in jail and in slavery and repeatedly accused the scripture pronounces that God was with him. And that is our encouragement. We actually don't have to accomplish the thing. We have to set the intention of our hearts. And the promise is that God is with us. The second prophetic word comes right on the heels of the first one, but there's about a month gap because they do take up the work of rebuilding the temple. But Haggai raises this question through God. Who of you is left who saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Does it not seem to you like nothing? This is an important question, particularly because the old temple was massive in size. And this one that they were rebuilding was a fraction of its size. And there were people that remembered what the old temple looked like. And so this question was significant. In fact, in fact, when they started to rebuild the foundation and it was so small, a lot of people were like super excited. And they're like, yeah. And then the old generation that remembered what the previous temple, they were crying. And the scripture says you couldn't distinguish between the crying and the, and the cheering. And so he raises this question. Do you remember what it used to be? And I think this raises another important question because once they started to work and once they moved past those barriers of discouragement, disappointment, and fear, there is another obstacle that emerges and that is the fear of comparison. Because once we start building, we see what it is and we have, a, we have an inkling of what this is going to look like. But then our eyes can be focused on comparing what it is right now to what it used to be in the past. Or I can look and see what somebody else is building and what their building project looks like and what their gifts look like and mine don't look like. And I remember what I used to be able to do and I'm not able to do that right now. And this is not the way that it was supposed to be. And when we compare, here's the danger. When I start comparing to about what somebody else is doing or what happened in the past, I miss what God is doing right now. 
Because God wants to do something new. And it might not look like what it looked like in the past. And it may not look like what somebody else is building. But he wants to do something new. And here's what the scripture says just a few verses later. It says the glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house. Because God is going to do something new. And it may not look like it looked like in the past or what somebody else did. But he's going to do something new. And comparison is extremely dangerous because we lose sight of what God is doing and we're looking at what somebody else is. And yet the word is sharp. Right after he raises these questions of comparison, he says to be strong. Why or how? For I'm with you. He repeats that relational promise again. And let me jump to the third prophetic word. There's a phrase that repeats throughout this third prophetic word. It is give careful thought. Other translation, translations suggest that it's consider your ways. And this is a charge of reflection. I think what Haggai is asking us to do is to give careful thought to all of our ways, to what we do, to what we love, to what we invest in, to what we spend our time in, to what we watch, to what we listen to, to who we spend our time with, and ultimately to how we choose to live our lives. And this is a perfect moment to give careful thought to how we live as we finish up one year and reflect back, but also set the intention of our heart going forward. We want to give careful thought to how we live. And the final portion of this third prophetic word is directed specifically at Zerubbabel, who is that king to be in waiting. And to offer some context to this, there was a prophecy in Jeremiah right before that temple was destroyed and part of his prophetic warning to those people. And he said, he called the king at that time his signet ring. And a signet ring looks like this. A signet ring was something that the king would wear on his finger. The one on the right has been unearthed recently and is suggested to perhaps be the signet ring that Pontius Pilate wore. The other one is one that is an Egyptian, but a king would wear it and would seal important documents with either wax or with ink, and that was how he signed. And what the Lord said in a prophecy through Jeremiah was, you king, you the king of Israel, you are my signet ring, and I take you off of my finger and I throw you away. And I suspect that there are some of us in the midst of discouragement, disappointment, fear, and comparison that feel like I have been discarded. But the book of Haggai ends with this. On that day, declares the Lord, I will take you, my servant Zerubbabel, and I will make you like my signet ring, for I have chosen you. He reverses that imagery from the past. And he says, I'm putting you on my finger because I have chosen you. And so as we consider carefully how we live, God makes the first move to us. We set the intention of our heart knowing that he has chosen us and he's with us. Would you pray with me?
God, I am so grateful that you chose us. God, for any of us that find ourselves in a place of discouragement or disappointment or fear, um, that has struggled and wrestled with comparison, God, I pray that you would just speak a gentle word of reminder and conviction in our hearts that we could re-sign up to follow you. That the intention of our hearts are to follow you and to love you. And would you help us to be strong and to follow hard after you. And Jesus, we are so grateful that you made the first move towards us. That you did not leave us in our place of delay or stalling or drift, but that you sent your son to be born as a baby, to give his life as a ransom for all of us. so that we could choose to follow you. In your name we pray.